We're going to go in three, two, one. Lions Lounge Lockdown, episode 19. Brian Horn. Horny, thanks for joining us, mate. My pleasure. Anytime. Really looking forward to it, mate. Really looking forward to it. Did you start your Mill career in the youth side? Yeah, I was at Millwall. I, I, my family, I'll start, my family are all Millwall supporters. So I'll go back to a young kid, five or six years old. My dad taking me, we lived in Essex. So my dad taking me on the train, Fenchurch Street. And all my family used to be, used to live in Peckham, Woodden Estate. So we used to go up to my nans and uh, walk down to Millwall. I used to be on the coal blow lane in with my old man and used to run down in the front. There used to be little holes in the wall. I don't know if you remember where the little kids used to put their feet in the wall and you could just watch, see over the over the wall at the coal blow lane and then see. If you were lucky, you got like some wooden steps behind the goal and you could get on them and see. And I was behind Brian King's goal. So, yeah, that's that's where it all started for me. My dad, Arden Millwall, he still goes today. He's 77. If he ain't got nothing to do, he, he goes away as well. We can't hardly walk. You know, he's, he's, oh, mate, he's amazing. He's my dad's, you know, he's been a season ticket holder for... I don't know, he's been going since 19, 1950 something. So, you know, he's he's uh, he's my idol, mate. And, uh, you know, he loves the club. He loves everything about it. Does loads of stats for the club, you know. So, um, you know, he's, he's brilliant. But, yeah, no. So, progressed from the juniors, as it was not the youth team, the juniors, and then eventually got me chance with Roger Cross. Eddie Eath, I know there's some bad, bad uh, news about Eddie. And, uh, obviously, at the time... Of, with uh, what he'd done with the kids and everything else. But he, he sort of took me on at the club, if you like. Um, and there was a player um, there at the same time called Roger Winter. I don't know if you remember, Roger, um, when we used to play the London Five Sides, uh, when that was still going on with all the club. And Millwall won it one year. Roger was the best foot. He was better than Gazza, let me tell you. He was unbelievable. He was brilliant. Yeah. Mugged an old lady for a pound in South London. That was his career done. Let me tell you one thing, and, and he's changed his life around. He looks after, um, in, in South London, like dis disabled children and different bits and pieces. Like, And uh, he never got another chance, mate, but he was unbelievable. If you can ever get the clips of the London Fiver side, Roger Winter, have a look at him. He was amazing. What is a mirror? Oh, he, he, I think I think he might have made one one performance or one uh, one appearance for the first team. But mate, he was he was unbelievable, unbelievable. Who else was in the youth team? Were any players that we might know? Uh, what well, my age? So in our in sort of Teddy, Johnny Neal, Neil Ruddock, Michael Marks, Darren Morgan, Paul Malcolm, uh, Lewis Robinson played left back. Jibbo uh, was um, see everyone calls him Razor, but we know him as Jibbo. Um, that's uh, like, and uh, Michael Marks was Skids. So um, you had he, and Neil was a centre half. Uh, sorry, he was left wing. Neil played left wing for the youth side. And then um, when when Teddy and John Neil sort of finished, it was Michael Marks and Paul Malcolm up front. But no, we had uh, Paul Golding was there. Um, Ryan. Someone, all local boys, which was great, all South London boys. What was he, um, Gippo? Razor Runner, why'd you call him Gippo? Uh, I think he was from Kent, and then like it was just Gippo, I think, at the time. So, I mean, whenever you see him, like his nickname ain't Razor, it's Gippo. And like, well, obviously, we got our own WhatsApp group, so he goes, After 40 years, boys, can't you change like from calling me Gippo? So we just go, No, like, so he's still Gippo, and obviously, he likes his Razor, doesn't it? So when you was youth team players, obviously that would have been George Graham then, wouldn't it, as the first team manager? Yeah, George, George, um, George. But Roger Cross had, had a big influence on all of us, Roger. Um, as you, I mean, he was youth team manager, reserve team manager. I mean, he, he was, for, for especially, I think, for me, Neil, Darren Morgan, the boys that come down from up north, Darren Morgan, Gary Middleton, Graham Jones. I don't think a lot of people know that Graham Jones was at the club as well. He was assistant manager to Roberto Martinez in the World Cup last year. But he was he was at Millwall. There was three of them that come down. Graham did make a Graham went out into non league and then come back into football. But Tomo and Gary Middleton we thought was going to make it, but um he, he didn't get a contract, but he had a fantastic non league career. But um yeah, Roger Cross he, he was uh, he was so dedicated with all of us, and he worked us hard, you know. 
Um, and we got our ground rules. You know, when you got Dave Kuzak and all the big hard old centre halves that, you know, you got to clean their boots or, do, you know, they didn't take no shit. You know, they'd give you a right slap if you didn't do it properly. And it, and it brought you up the right way, I've got to tell you. So, you know, took respect for the, you know, from day one. And then obviously when George came in, he was a disciplinarian and uh, you had to do your work. Otherwise, uh, you, you was on your toes, you know. Yeah, I was going to say, what was it like being uh, being in a youth team around that time and having to clean the boots? I remember Razor said he got a bollock in once for the Luton thing. He got pictured at the Luton game and George Graham made him clean the stands for about three weeks. Yeah, we was all there. The Luton game, all, we went in the bus and we went to watch the game Luton. And, uh, you know, it weren't the fact that we wanted to go on the pitch. It was the fact that we didn't have a choice. We didn't have a choice to go on the pitch. And obviously everybody's running, so we're, we're, we're running also. It just so happened that Neil got the photo and all, well, none of us didn't. So... Um, but yeah, it, mate, it was it was an amazing time of my life. I've got to tell you, it was just just, just being at Millwall Football Club, growing up, um, becoming a boy to a man. Really, um, it was it was um, it's a, it was the best time of my life, without a doubt. Even beats getting married to the old woman. <laughs> and then, um, well, so hopefully she won't be watching this, but she might well agree. So, <laughs> your, your old man then must have felt unbelievable. To take you as a boy, watching you, you got your sort of introduction to Mill goalkeeping from Brian King, and then to, to, to make your way out through the youth ranks and then into the, into the first team, your debut season, the 1986-87 season, you, you was pretty much straight in, mate, 38 appearances. Yeah, I, I'll never forget it. I'll never forget. We were Sheffield United away, and... Uh... I, I was just travelling. Paul Sanson was, you know, as far as I thought, he was fit and well. Mm. So we got to the ground, and I forget, in, in the Bramwell Lane, and there was a phone just on the side in the tunnel area. So um, he named the team, and he went, all number one. I went, what? And I'm fucking shit myself now. Got Peter with up front. So, like, um, so he said, you're playing. I said, what's wrong with Sammy? Sammy, what's the matter? He said, I've got the shit, I can't play. So I'm straight on the phone. I went to me, Dad, Dad, I'm playing. He went, shut up. I went, Dad, I'm fucking playing. I said, can you pick me up after the game at Gansill Roundabout? I said, I'll be there about one o'clock. He went, yeah, I'll be there. But I was so disappointed from my dad because he's seen every game I've played apart from the debut. So it was it was, um, it was was unbelievable. Peter Wiv was up front and I had a half a decent game apart from their second goal. But like the first corner coming and Peter with just went smack. And he, he all over the place. It was all over the place. And he went, You ready to start your league career now, son? I know it's your debut. And it was and it was the best thing that could have happened to me. Unbelievable the best thing because it just said from a youth team player to a first team, or you know, because I didn't play any reserve games hardly. It went from the youth team straight into the first team. And it, like that elbow thought, right, hold up a minute, I'm in a different level of game here, I've got to live it up. Mm. And that was it. I had a fantastic, fantastic sort of 80 minutes and the rain started coming down, a shot coming and I'd saved everything all night and a shot coming in, it just squealed underneath my body and went in. And uh, uh, that was that. Um, you know, it, 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 taught me, it taught me so much that night. And then we played away at Stoke and we got beat 2-0 and Doc was shrewd. You know, he he, he pulled me out after that. Two, two uh, big games and... Um, two defeat and Sammy went back in for six games um, and then I went back in and after that and played quite a few games on the trot. How old was you? You're quite young you made your debut, wasn't you? I think I was 19, 20. I weren't, I weren't you know, really, uh, you know, it, it, I suppose it's young these days, but, you know, I was good enough. I, I'm not going to, you know, I was good enough to be in there. I was, I, was a, I was a decent gamer at that age. What's it like going into a dressing room Managed by John Doherty. Some some big hitters. We didn't do too well in the league that year. It was sort of a bit of a nothing finish. 16th. We still had the likes of Les Briley, Jimmy Carter, Terry Erlock, Alan McCleary, Darren Morgan, Dennis Salmon, Teddy and Rhino. I think growing up, like when you was in a press, you saw Macca and you saw Rhino. Do you know what I mean? Two players that... Uh, Rhino was so aggressive, mate. You know, fucking get that done. You know, in the dressing room, he's just so aggressive. And Macca was a little bit more calm and, and calculated. But um, yeah, it was it was great, you know, because all the youth team players that had come before us and been in the first team, you were striving to do what they had done. Nicky Coleman, do you know what I mean? There was uh, John Neal was in the first team. Teddy was getting in the first team, you know. Um, and uh, you know, but you know the story about Ted, didn't you? George didn't like him, or George George made his career, if I'm honest, because 
Teddy loved to score the perfect goal. Every training session, he wanted to chip the keeper or he wanted to bend it in the top corner. And it weren't happening for him, you know, under George. So George sent him to Sweden. He went to Sweden and played for a team called Do Gordons out there and come back. He had scored the most hat tricks ever. And then when he came back, George made him just hit balls in the back of the net after the training session, smash him in the back of the net. And from then on, he just went, you, you asked Ted if you ever get to win, I don't know if you've done Ted, but like, as I say to you, um, that, that sort of George made his career. He didn't like it at the time, Ted, he hated him. But I'm sure if you go back, he, he'll tell you that he put him on the right path and told him how hard it was. So yeah, going back to your question, seeing all them players come through the youth team and getting into Mill's first team, it was a club that was going to give youth a chance. Mm. You always knew, and that's why my dad, I think as well, I had loads of clubs after me as a kid, my family in Mills, of course, I'm going nowhere else. I could have signed for Man United, Arsenal, Norwich, really? West Ham, dare I say it. I could have signed for a lot of clubs. But my dad said, you sign up with Millwall and that's it. You know, it's end of story. So schoolboy forms of 14, apprentice at 16, and then sort of professional forms at 18, 17, 18, and then into the first time. It really? sort of happened really quick for me. Um, and then obviously in between that, I was playing for England youth, under 18s, 19s, 20s, and then eventually 21s. But it was it was um, it was it was fantastic, you know. You had to grow up very quickly and, and learn your trade. Doc was obviously an, like an old school geezer with a lot of old older school players in that side. Did he? How did he cope with you? He said you said he done the right thing by whipping you out after a couple of games. Was he was he aware of you? Was he you know? Did he fully appreciate you being there and? Oh, and mate, him? Doc, Doc, man management. And we're going to other management. George Graham was brilliant. Let me tell you, George Graham changed Millwall Football Club. Before we get on to Doc, yeah. let me just say, George Graham turned Millwall in a proper football club. He, you know, beforehand, I mean, I'll go back to Peter Anderson, George Pet, George Petchy, you know, all the old managers and, and being around the club, even as a schoolboy at that time. When George came in, he put discipline into the club and he changed it. He brought in the players that got us promoted. And then obviously went to Arsenal and, and done fantastic things. But make no bounds about it. Where we are today as a football club with new stadiums and everything else started with George Graham. And then and then obviously when George went, Doc come in. But Doc was that eye, mate. He's 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 nothing. He's you know, he's a, a little little, you know, just a little fella. And um but he commanded so much respect because of the way he treated us. Didn't treat us like kids, he treated us like men. But when we decided to be like kids, then he then he would uh, you know pull you and and uh, but he never find you. He would he was very clever. He, you know I will tell you a little tale that one day I got into training five minutes late. So I, I from Essex over the Dartford Tunnel when there was only one tunnel, I was in the Dartford Polytechnic where we trained, and um, and then into training. So that little journey of twenty five miles would take me an hour and a half. So. I got in five, 10 minutes late. So he went, see it at the ground after. So I went, Doc, traffic, see it at the ground after. So anyway, you get changed and you? you drive, you've got to drive back now to South London, sit at the ground. So Doc comes back, go knock on his door when I ain't ready for you yet. So I went, so anyway, he knew where I lived. He, he, he obviously knows it. So he knew that if he kept me at the ground till five o'clock, that uh, I'm going to hit the rush hour traffic and not get in all seven. So he, eventually, five o'clock, I'm knackered and I've, I'm sitting in the chair and, and like, I thought he smokes Hamlet. So if he was naughty, you used to have to go and buy five Hamlet for him down the shop. So, <laughs> I, so, 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 like, so I sort of nipped out, got his five Hamlet, knocked on the door, four o'clock, not ready for you yet, son. Doc, I've got your five Hamlet. I don't, I'm not ready for you yet, so I'm going to go and sit in the players' lounge. So five o'clock comes, I'm ready for you now. So I said, sorry, Doc, here's your amulet. So he went, you waste your my time, I'll waste yours. See you in the morning. And oh, that was, God. it was just little lessons like that that made you realise you had all, all day to get there from yesterday, get there on time, otherwise, you know, I'm going to fucking waste your time. I ain't going to find you, I'm just going to waste your time. So you could have had a game of golf book with the boys after or whatever, you're knackered, you can't do it. So mm. all little lessons like that. From growing up with Doc and that, it was brilliant, absolutely fantastic. So that season, you say so you, you did play a few more games, but then the following season, obviously when things just went crazy at the club, what changed in that summer? You think for us to finish sixteenth, um, we didn't make loads of signings. We made a few important ones: Steve Wood, Kevin O'Callaghan, uh, Cass, George Lawrence. But yeah, big players. I suppose you say the first three. What what changed? Did the 
I think, you know, you say Kevin O'Callaghan, he was a Millwall man. You know, Cali was there beforehand, obviously he moved to Portsmouth, then he went to Ipswich, and then he came back. George Lawrence had, had, had first division experience with Southampton. Stevie Wood was a good centre half. He came in from Reading, I believe. Um, and Terry, that had come in the year before, he was a fresh of fresh air. The camaraderie um, in the dressing room was like nothing you've ever seen. It was unbelievable. Everybody in that dressing room would have run through a brick wall for each other. Doc and Frank had built that. Doc and Frank. I mean, I can remember playing away at Stoke once. Um, we stayed at like, Millwall's expense. We stayed in Kill University. Now, we all had a dormitory to sleep in before the game. So I think after the game, they capped us up there and we were just going to do some exercise. Well, we was, we was in a local boozer. We, I think we had won 2-0. About 12 o'clock, doing oops upside your head on the floor. Like everybody like that, we just won 2 nil, smashed out of our heads. Walking back and Frank said to me, Frank went, he said, you're a little fucking idiot. You. He said, I can have you any day. Do you know what I mean? So I said, come on in, Frank, let's have it now, me and you. So he ran towards me. I pick him up and threw him and broke his ribs. So not, <laughs> not, not purposely, it wasn't done purposely, but the next day he ran the bollocks off me. He said, don't ever do you know, mucking about. But he, was, he, weren't taken, but he weren't taken to offence. But he just said, I'm going to run the bollocks off you tomorrow now you've done that. But that's how it was. It was it was brilliant, unbelievable. Was he just pissed up and said, like, for a laugh, come on, let's have it? Or he no, just no, 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 no. No, d- 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 don't, don't get that wrong. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have won and got promoted if we was on the piss all the time. We, we, it wouldn't have happened. You know, we, we all looked after ourselves. You know, no matter what anybody says about me weight, I would have played 51 games twice on a row and been playing for England if I was overweight. You know, so, um, you know, it was, it was just, it was very professional. We all worked hard for each other and we was all young. I mean, if you have a look at it, Teddy, 20s, me, 20s, uh, Macca, mid twenties, Rhino, mid twenties. You know, Danny Salmon had come from Brentford with them. Uh, you had Woody, probably mid twenties. Uh, Nicky Coleman had come through the youth team. Um, mm-hmm. You know, as we say, Kevin O'Callaghan probably mid to late twenties, something like that when he come back. But we was all young, energetic, enthusiastic, and we we just like Cass Millwall supporter, Armour Millwall supporter, Darren Morgan Millwall supporter. Mickey Marks, Millwall supporter. We were all the Dave Mehmet, Millwall supporter. That we were all we were all Millwall. We'd come through the youth team. We'd supported the club as kids. Do you know what I mean? We wanted to. We wanted to be. We wanted to win. It was just we knew something just clicked. Cass and Ted. You know, it was something just clicked. I, I can't tell you what it was, but we weren't getting beat mm. right through the team. We weren't getting beat. You know, everybody, you know, leads away. Was it, did leads away, was it in the same season where we won 2-0? So, uh, yes. Terry Erlock scored one and can't remember. But, I mean, to go up there and win and in front of all them, all the Leeds fans and everything else, I mean, they're still the bogey side, which is great, which is lovely, isn't it? We like that. But um, it's, uh, it's it, it was just an unbelievable time, mate. It, we knew, as I said, we'd grown up all together, most of that squad, had come through the youth team, had been together for the last three or four years, trying to strive to get in the first team. And then all of a sudden, bang, we're all in it. A few little additions. And we weren't going to get beat. We weren't. It was just, I can't explain it. You knew. You knew you weren't going to get beat. Let's talk about a few of them games to run in. First up, Bournemouth away. I watched the highlights earlier. Yeah. Um, Big, big save, big penalty save from you that day. What, What do you remember of that day? Um... I think we were all nervous because I think we knew that if we won that game, we was there. Do you know what I mean? We 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 were we we were nearly there, and everybody was a bit nervous. I mean, it helped with the early goal, um, and then Terry come up with that unbelievable dart through the midfield and smashed it in, smashed it in over the keeper, um, and then Tony Pulis got one back for them. So come out, and then it, and it was just about right. Okay, let's settle down, everybody. Now let's just do our jobs, defend play a bit of football and see how we go. And I can remember it very clearly. I can't remember the black fella that played up front for them. Fair Clough, was it? Or Fair? can't remember. But he got above it, edited it down, and it come up awkwardly. And Macca had two choices. He could either handball it or he, he was going to go through with their player. So he, he sort of done a sneaky little arm, as you do, and the referee saw it and he gave a penalty. So it, it was one of them. I was... I, was, uh, I just... Had a, had a 
a way of what I would do and how, what way I would go. I saved a few penalties, but I saw you. By the way, sorry, I saw you. I saw you walk up on the highlights earlier. I yeah, saw you walk up and hand him the ball, and I thought you said something. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I got the ball. Uh, it was just a bit of psychology. Just walked up to the ball. Here's the ball, son. Now you've got to score. Do you understand what I mean? Here's the ball. You've got to beat me now. There you go. So it was just it's just a little bit of psychology. And the way he ran up to the ball, he was too straight. He couldn't whip it into that corner. It was too straight. So it was touch me toes as I did. Look at look at his run up and then bang, I knew where I was going. I, I knew where I was going because his run up dictated that. And, and and you know, the rest is history. We we saved the penalty and and that was that. We was we was near enough there. Two minutes to go. Good where the ball's gone, but anyway, there's another one coming on the field, and it's Richard Cook. Number 10 of Bournemouth. Well, what a vital pe penalty kick this is, because if Bournemouth lose tonight, with only one more home game, they really will be in serious, serious trouble. The point, well, it's better than nothing, isn't it? So, Cook gets on, and he saved it! Oh, they've got bananas behind that goal. I think in all my football career, I know we played in the first division, that was the biggest adrenaline rush I ever had. I mean, you don't usually save a penalty and stick your arm up as though, you know, you're God. But it was just such an adrenaline rush at the time and it meant so much to everybody. I mean, you see Teddy kiss me, Darren Morgan run up and kiss me. You know, it, was, it meant so much to everybody and everybody had put in such a shift over the course of the season that... You know, it was my turn really to say thank you to them. To, to you know, so that, that, that's just how it turned out. And I can remember getting the ball and trying to throw it to Rhino, and I thought I'd overthrown it because the adrenaline was still rushing in my body. But you see, Rhino, you just suck out a leg, and it, it thankfully stuck to his foot, and uh, for one of the many times it did, and and just he, he smashed it down the line. So yeah, the whistle went, and I can remember a geezer run on the pitch, and I thought he's a Bournemouth supporter. So I thought, here we go, and then he pulled his top out, and he's Millwall. So hey, it was lovely. It was good. Following that was a two 0 home win against yeah. Stoke. Yeah. Uh, I, had to, I had to look that one up. Everyone knows about the Bournemouth game. Everyone knows about the whole game. But in between yeah. that, we obviously... We stoke, stoke at home. Again, you know, you knew that that game was it. That game was, that game was, you know, you win that game, you're there. You know, no one's going to stop us. Too many people were too far behind. We weren't getting beat. As I say, we knew what we had to do. Teddy and Cass, uh, you know, were scoring. The midfield was great. Um, you know, and, and that was it. You know, everybody was so focused. So, so focused, you know, into training, go home, rest, you know, get ready, make sure you, you know, you prepared yourself, you know, mm. and uh, it was, it was brilliant. It was, you know, and, and Stoke and then it was our way. Oh. Just talk about our way, go as long as you like. Well, it weren't, I can't remember it being a brilliant game. Can't remember it being a, a brilliant game, but it was one we needed to win. And I think Cali had scored about six or seven penalties in, in them 13 games that you're talking about that run. Mm. It was... You know, Cali, Cali had scored at least six penalties during that run, and we had one sort of one nil or you know two one or whatever it may be. But um, yeah, I can, I can remember that um, I had to make a save low down to me left early on, and I pulled I pulled a little muscle in me in me hip, and I thought, fuck it, I've got to get through the game. You know, I don't want to go off. I've got to get through the game. Um, so from that onwards, I didn't have a lot to do. I think I had to come for one cross or something near the end of the game, something like that. And like the boys done the rest. And it was just a doggy performance. Got the penalty, Cali scored it. And then the rest was history. It was, it was like just, as I say to you, the relief that drained out of you from, from working hard and doing it. And as I said about my dad, for getting promoted for the first time in the club's history, to the top flight was just extra. And my mum, my nan was there. My granddad was there and they saw it. They're dead now, but they, they saw it. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was, uh, you know, it's brilliant. You know, it's brilliant for me, dad, brilliant for, for all the family. Mm. And, um, you know, it, it was just a great. So anyway, after the game, Reg Burr, Reg Burr has gone, uh, right, let's back to the hotel. No one's going anywhere. Champagne all night on us. Right. So, so anyway, there used to be a lady 
that looked after all our hotel bits and pieces. Doc brought in a lady to do all the hotels and all that, so it was taken away and everything was done. She was like a little salt. She was nice. So so after after the game, I could nick a bird every now and then. So so after the game, we're sitting down having a deer, and the lady's gone now. I said, uh, "Fancy having a slip then, or what? Shall we get? Shall we go and get a, a, like a little bit of champagne somewhere else?" So me and her slipped away from the dinner table. Alan McClear has clocked it, hasn't it? So anyway, we've gone off for half hour. I'm, I'm strong in it. It could be about ten minutes, but I'm going to say half hour. <laughs> right. So we, we've gone. We've we've gone off. Anyway, come back to the dinner table, finish the dinner like with all the boys there. Anyway, they've got we've got clock, so I've had a, I've had a bit of fun. So so um, uh, the boys said oh, we ain't going to fucking stay in here. He said we're going to go out. So me, Teddy, Dean Oryx, Gus Resi Soul, Stevie Wood, whatever. We ended up in a nightclub where it was Hull's presentation fucking evening. <laughs> right. So anyway, Woody's pulled a nurse. Woody's pulled a nurse. I, 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 I should don't see this. I might get him in trouble. But anyway, Woody, Woody's pulled a nurse and and uh, so on and so forth. Anyway, we've got back to the hotel about you know, about half two, quarter three, because the nightclubs used to shut at two o'clock in the morning, didn't they? Yeah. Everyone's still up drinking. Everybody. Doc's clocks us in. He went, you, you, you and you, two o'clock, well in against Cholton. So we had to get back and play against Charlton, right? We stayed up till seven in the morning drinking. Roger Cro- Roger Cross has got the van. He's like he's, he's brought the van up with all the uh, whatever. So we're, we're in the van about seven o'clock in the morning, going back from Hull to Welling to play against Charlton because we weren't supposed to go out of the hotel. So there was me. I think we got beat six. I think we got beat. Like we got. What are you not doing here? We said, "Oh, the long story." So we had to play against. What's that? Was your punishment? Yeah, no. It was just like you're not bigger. You know what I mean? Everybody else has stayed in. You should have stayed in with us. And like, so like I said before, he teaches you lessons, doesn't he? Promoted for the first time ever into the English top flight. Next yeah. day, you're playing in a resi game at Wellin. Yeah, well, that's it, isn't it? That's great, isn't it? That's what it's all about. It's all it's all good fun. So, you know, that was it. And then obviously Blackburn come, didn't it? Blackburn come. And uh, you know, we were proper on the piss. We were like for that week, you know, we they were given we were given two days off where we we're golfing and drinking and, and whatever, and the relief was you know, it had gone. We had fit we were we were finished. Do you know what I mean? We'd put so much into it um that we were finished. I mean, we didn't want to lose, don't get us wrong. It was it was a carnival day and you know, it's unbelievable. Um, we didn't want to lose, but I think it was just the fact that we put so much in through the season. We were champions, but there's no more we could do. And um, that was it. Well, after the game, we got beat 4 2. Doc's come in and he started laying into us. And like Frank said to go, hold on a minute. We just won the league here. You're having a go at the boys. We just won the league. Let's get on it. So so that was it. The, the One other thing, one other thing I left out. When we played our way, right? Yeah. When we got there, their chairman had put in the dressing room all in cases and all that, 12 bottles of bubbly. Doc in front of us, you can imagine this, smashing everybody, whatever, whatever, every one of them. You ain't done fucking nothing yet, boys. He smashed 12. You can imagine Terry Earl, look, fucking Doc, what are you doing? He said, there's 12 bottles of thing there we can have. He smashed every one of them, Doc. You ain't done nothing yet. So oh, that, that, that was it. That, 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 that got us... That got us um, ready to go out for the for the old game of ways before the game. The chairman's trying to said if you win, you can have that on the coach after. Well, that's what we wanted. Every one of us, what we wanted. So I think after the old game, we chucked him in the bath top, fully clothed. So we got our own back anyway. But um, yeah, it was it was you know that's one of the things. So after the game, then that was it. It was um, it was um, unbelievable. And uh, uh, as well, I think they did. They go. They went away to Australia, Penang. And somewhere, uh, Penang and somewhere else. Well, me, Terry and Maka, Terry and, and uh, Maka were playing for England and I was in the under-21s. I was in France, Maka and Terry was in, uh, in Iceland. Well, our competition finished a bit later. We was in a tournament, a Toulon tournament. So my tournament finished a bit later and and Terry's and Maka, they, they got on to go up playing and meet, them, meet the boys in Penang. For people who may not know who watching, we win the league, Mill get taken away, but you can't go because you're in duty with the England under-21s and Terry and uh, Macca, uh, Alan McCleary, were being international to that point, I believe. 
Yeah, yeah. So yeah. They, they've been allowed to go to Benin. So I'm, I'm on the phone. I've got back. Doc, can I get on the plane now and join the boys? No, stay at home. Set up. So that was it. So, but that, that was because he wanted me to rest. I'd had a long season. I played. He wanted me to rest. It wasn't, wasn't anything personal or anything like that. He was thinking of me. So did you miss the end of the season, end of season jolly up? Yeah. Oh. So, so yeah, but they took another goalkeeper because they played a game, I think, or whatever. Oh. I can't remember who it was. It might have been Phillips. I can't remember. But um, but anyway, so Terry and, and Mac has got there. Well, everybody's at the bar. They've just got to Penang. Where's Tell? So Tell's walked down the stairs in his England strip. <laughs> Top to toe in his England strip. Sat there just drinking a beer in his England strip all night. Yeah, I mean, I weren't there, but you can imagine, can't you? Where the boys and, and the doc and everyone must have loved it. But that was that was the camaraderie of the team, mate. It was it was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. Who was your closest to? Would you say was there anyone particular or just everyone? Me and this? Teddy shared. Me and I, I'm a bad snorer, so me and Teddy shared for maybe two or three years. You, he was always asking me, "How do I beat a keeper? What do I need to do? What's going to beat him? Where do I put it?" He was always asking me, you know, you know, what's going to be? And I always say, pace beats the keeper. We hadn't even gotten to, yeah, obviously, we win promotion and you play in the top flight. Unbelievable times at a club. It didn't really, um, it sort of went with the players that we had, showed faith in the players that got him there. So, was you I, I, I think he was right. I think that was right. I think he was right to do that. I'm not so sure in the second season. Yeah. But I think I think um, in the first the first season we we'd shown we were champions. So why couldn't we last the pace in the in the first division? Mm. Um, and I think we've I think we caught a lot of the teams by surprise. I think they they didn't realise how good we were. If I was honest with Terry and Les, I wouldn't like to play against Terry and Les now. I mean Terry was a good footballer. People just say he was an hard man. Terry could play. Yeah. Terry Terry could play football. Les was just lucky with shit. But he just he just got the ball and like played with Terry, you know. But um, no, I'm only joking this. But um, he was um, them two in the middle of the park, mate. They we were only, we only got we only signed um, Ian Dawes, brilliant player, brilliant and Brazer signing. come back to the club. And then yeah. late, later on in the season, in the early pop, Geordie Paul Stevenson. Let's talk about yeah. uh, Ian Dawes. One of the best signings we've ever made. Yeah. If I'm honest with you, he, he came from QPR. I think Doc went to watch a different player uh, in a reserve game at QPR. And uh, Dorsey had a stormer and he, we ended up signing him. Um, and uh, he was, I mean, I, I remember the first game Aston Villa away, me and him got a bit of a mix up with uh, Alan McAnally. And I didn't have nowhere to go. I got to the ball first and sort of Dorsey went into the way I was going to kick it. So, you know, I was knackered and it rebounded kindly for. And Ali, and he, and he stuck it away. But um, yeah, he was Dorsey was, um, and, and if he hadn't got his knee injury, I think he would, you know, he would have done a good 12, 13 years at the club. Mm. He was refreshing. He knew his job. He worked hard. Great left foot, and um, you know, he, he was brilliant to be around. Very dedicated. Um, you know, never really went out with the lads. If I was honest, he used to go home and, and get his rest. But like, really nice lad. Um, and then Razor come back. He, he'd been away where he, he had been Tottenham by then, and he? he'd been at Tottenham. He didn't work out from there and come back. And he, he um, yeah, he'd done all right. He didn't really get in the team again. He didn't. He didn't really fit into into Doc's plans. I didn't think he was there just as a safeguard, just in case someone got injured. Um, so that was that. And I think he moved on pretty quickly. He went to Southampton, didn't he? Yeah, did the doc sit you all down and say like, look, if you get promoted, I'll show faith in you? Or you know, was you aware of that, or did he just? No, he, he, as I say, he, 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 he treated us like men. He, he, if he needed to be changed, I think Frank and Doc would have got together and done it. But you know, he, they they showed faith in us, and, and and we showed faith. You know, we worked hard for them. I mean, you know, the first ten games in the, in the first division, I think we got beat once, maybe mm -hmm. Middlesbrough away. I think apart from that, it was a it was it was a really good start. What was the buzz? What was the buzz like amongst you know to being around? Obviously, yeah, uh, obviously. Man, yourself and your family. What was the what was the feeling around Bermondsey and amongst Mill fans? Yeah. I mean, you say going back. Let me just go back a bit. Sorry, but the night the night we got promoted after the Blackburn game, we all went up the Old Kent Road to uh, the Jim Palace. Yeah, um, and. I've never seen anything like it in my life. The whole road was packed full of Millwall sports. The old Kent Road was just a stream. They're on, they're on, you know, on on lampposts. It was 
jam packed. It was just unbelievable feeling. And, and my mum and dad just say this is what it used to be like in the old days, you know. But it, it was just something that you couldn't experience. The whole of South London was, I, don't, I can't explain it, just joyous. You know, great big smiles on people's faces. Never thought they'd see the day that we, you know, not just from my mum and dad, but generations, you know, that, that they've been going to Millwall, that they'd never thought they'd seen the day. So that that night uh, was, was I mean, uh, another story coming out was in there and my dad had just had a triple heart bypass. It was three or four weeks into it. So he said, come and say, I'm going out, I'm all right. So I went out with, I don't know, I, I think I had a few quid in my pocket that night. So we went up there and my dad's just ordering bottles of champagne, not drinking them, just fucking ordering bottles of champagne, going downstairs and having something to eat. My bill came to about 600 quid at the end of the night, which is a lot of money in them days. So I had to wait out and then I realised I can't get home. I ain't got a car. And it just so happened that my mates were in there, but they were bollocks also and their car was outside. So I made a decision that I was going to drive home. There was seven of us in the car. Absolute stupid thing to do, right? Unbelievable. So as I pulled out of the, uh, of the turning to go along the road, woo woo, literally not even two yards, coppers come along. Only what the fucking hell are you doing? Follow me, follow me, and they escorted me to the Dartford Tunnel. Did they really? They escorted me to the Dartford Tunnel. I got through the Dartford Tunnel and then I was home. Oh my god! Turn so, the blind eye. You just got. Oh through. mate, unbelievable! Unbelievable! Oh, mate, I was done. I, I was, you know, for all that jubilation and everything we'd done, I, I was going to be in the nick. I was done. He, uh, he, he must have been a Millwall supporter, guys. He must have been. So he, he just followed me all night, and we got home. And then unbelievable. So, so that was that day. It was, it was, you know, that was that's what it was like. So we, we got in about seven in the morning. But you know, going back to to the um, the first year, it was. We was all so – we wanted to play against the big club and to play against Aston Villa the first game and Derby the second game. Although we, we didn't lose in both of them, it was we, – we, we hadn't really we hadn't really played a top club. Well, in my notes, I, I see exactly what I've got. You, we, you was in the top flight. Obviously, Aston Villa got promoted with us. Yeah. You know, tasted the own wins, big win at home against Everton. But the first real away was uh, away at Liverpool on the 12th of November. Oh. <laughs> What was that like? And Paul Stevenson. Oh, mate, that was that was probably. I think that's the best result in the club's history. Yeah, I think you know with a team that Liverpool had, um, and you're seeing that game, right? Ter- right at the end, Terry Erlock gets hurt. I've never seen Terry Erlock get hurt. Steve McMahon broke his ribs right at the end of the game, yeah. um, and uh, you're seeing him go down on his haunches in the penalty area. But uh, you know. You can't imagine, can you, running out, nervous. The amount of Millwall fans that were there and the noise they made was just... Um, well, you don't expect anything different. They were brilliant. And it, it was, you know, one nil out. Paul Stevenson, his debut for the Lions. Do you know what I mean? I can remember. There was a little bit of interplay. It went out to Alan McCleary, come back in. Then there was a little bit of interplay. It come into Teddy. Teddy knocked it across. And then Paul Stevenson... He was just there running onto it and smashed it past Uber. Cleary. O'Callaghan. Riley. And now a chance for Sheringham. Stevenson. And he scores! Stevenson has scored on his debut! And all of a sudden, you won one-nil up. You won one-nil up at Anfield. You know, Mill fans are uh, unbelievable. The Liverpool fans are shocked. They've got McMahon, Beardsley, Barnes, you know, uh, Nickel, uh, Whelan. You know, they've, they've got a, a, a European winning team out there. So, um, you know, we're one nil up. I think another 10 minutes in, um, then, then they equalised. I know it was a bad clearance by Macca. I think it was uh, Bugsy Burrows for them. Burrows got a crossing. Macca um, knocks it out and then Nichols hit it. I didn't have any chance of it. Hit the post and win it. Yeah, so it was a good strike, 1-1. And then, and then it was, you know, it weren't backs against 
Walden either. We we competed. There was a few saves I had to make in the game. There was one at the end that I think was an important save. They had a free kick on the edge of the box. Um, it might, might have been the last two last two minutes, and um, it come through. And I I, had to, I think he who's the Irish international out up front. Um, I can't remember. I had to come out and he he done me in the knee, but I got it to it, and then he sort of scissor kicked it, and it went wide. But that that was an important save for me. Two yellow cards in the match, and it's Barnes to take the free kick. And it's wide by Hawk. And The boys busted a gut that day. The boys worked hard, and to come away from Anfield 1-1, I mean, it just told us that we were good enough to compete in the league. We were good enough that season and it gave us great belief, great belief that we could compete. We weren't going to win the league. We knew that. Mm. Um, maybe we, we had more of a chance of winning in them days than we do than you would do today. But um, we could compete. And, and, and the, the mentality that we had the year before where we went up and didn't get beat, the mentality was still there in the team because it hadn't changed too much. We didn't know what defeat felt like. Mm. We didn't know what defeat was. You know, so, so, so how, how did the doc approach these sort of games? What, what was his team talk, or did he have to really, really even give one? No, he, 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 not really. He, he might have a chat with us individually during the week, and or you know, we want you to do that today, or or you know, we might work a little bit during the week. But it was set pieces. We were good at set pieces with Cass and Ted, so we would have worked quite a bit on them during the week and looked at their weaknesses, what, what areas to put the ball in, so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, it was just how it was. I think everybody everybody knew, you know, the back four, Rhino, Macca, Woods, uh, who play and Dorsey that day, I think it was. Um, you know, me and Go, we were a solid back five. You know, we didn't we didn't concede too much. We didn't we didn't really concede too much. And we knew everybody's each other's game. So, you know, that's that's it was it was decent. And, we, and as I say, don't underestimate Terry and Les. They were a false mate. Mm. They were a force in that division and they were strong. And uh, when either one of them was injured or didn't play, we missed them massive. Going back to just a little bit before that, as you quickly mentioned, the Everton game at home, how did these big guns, these superstars, fair, were turning up to a ground that looked like it had just grown there in the middle of fucking the state? Oh, that's, all, that's all I've ever known. So as far as I was concerned, you know, the reputation that we had was to our advantage. Yeah. You know, when Millwall fans get going and that season, I mean, it was packed. It's 23, 24,000 packed in there. I mean, my dad's been in the ground with 48, by the way, the old den. So, you know, with 20, when, when the Azure used to come out of the tunnel, that used to be all standing uh, on the left-hand side. So, yeah. you know, it was... It, it, you know, they had to come and beat us. I weren't worried about Everton. And, you know, of course, as a young goalkeeper, you've got Neville Southall at the other end. You've got Peter Shilton at the other end, you know. The, Peter Shilton was my idol growing up. And and sort of now you're sort of in the England squad with him, travelling away to Sweden when Blue Butcher had this bandage round his head. I'm in the youth team, the under-21s or whatever he's at the time now. And then you're playing against him next week, against Derby. It's, it's surreal a little bit. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you couldn't look at it like that. Right, OK, you know, we've got a... We've got to step up today and we've got to beat we've got to beat Evan at home. And having Teddy and Cass up front, we always had a chance. Doc and Frank didn't want to put too much pressure on us. You know, they knew that we were playing big clubs. We knew we were playing Liverpool. He didn't want to they didn't want to come in and say, like him, John Barnes, world class, Peter Beardsley, different class, bringing McMahon in the middle of the park's great. You know, he, he didn't he didn't want to say that. He you know, he, Terry, you can take him, you know, no problem. Unless you pick up, you know, it was just a day-to-day -day routine. They didn't, they didn't want to ever put out a vibe that we was in trouble, and it never come across that way. No, we've done really well first season, and we was obviously top at one point. Do you remember us going top of the league? QPR, another penalty save, I believe. Do you know what that game as well? Trevor Francis scored a goal, mate, and I should have saved it. I, I, you know, I, and I, I can remember that he, he sort of. I think we went one up, and I can't remember, but he sort of cut inside and he shot. And I, I don't know if I've gone down in stages, but it's nicked me in that post. And I've gone to myself, how has he scored that? You know, how has he scored that? But it was lucky that um, I think we were 3-1 up or or 3 two, whatever it may have been. And Trevor Francis had a penalty kick and I saved it. Trevor Francis 
a chance for his second of the afternoon and fourth of the season. Francis against Horn. Oh, what a save! Knocked out and then held. And congratulations all round for Brian Horn from players and crowd. That puts top of the league for 24 hours, which, you know, it's, it's, it's unbelievable, isn't it? It's never been done again. I don't think it'll be, you know, uh, well, one day hopefully it'll be done, but, you know, not for this, you know. It's, yeah, of course. Top of the league, walking out of Millwall. <laughs> you know, I've been brought up in Essex, do you know what I mean? I've been brought up in Essex, so you can imagine I'm going to school with West Ham fans, Millwall, you know, so it was them two seasons, you know, we beat West Ham at West Ham as well in the Simod Cup, was it? 2-1. So them two seasons was a season where I gave it back to the West Ham fans, you know, that been massive, do you know what I mean? So it was, it was, it was all, you know, all good fun. And you know, I, I can always remember as well when I was an apprentice, I, had to, I used to get uh, used to get on a train and have to go past West Ham's ground. So if they were playing at home of an evening and I just finished a youth team game, West Ham supporters, I got my Millwall bag. I got my Millwall bag underneath. I'm I'm sitting there like that, 16, 70 year old shit myself. I think I'm gonna get sorted here. <laughs> you know. But luckily, luckily it never happened. But um yeah, it was you know, it, it just uh, loads of things come flooding back and, and memories and everything else. But as, as you say, Doc, never put any pressure. Sure, he knew would we perform. He knew the group of players he had wanted to play for him and he had the dressing room and um, that's what he needed. Um, I mean, listen, we, you've got loads of good stories to tell, man. We're not in no rush, but and I don't usually talk about individual particular games, but this was such an iconic time, one that will probably, as we both said, will be very difficult to ever happen again. But later that season, uh, we went away to Man United in January, Arsenal away February got got a nil nil draw. What was it like going to these sort of places and yeah, I mean, you, you you had played there in the youth team. You might have played there in the Southern Junior Fudley Cup or something like that. You'd played at the grounds, you know, as a kid or whatever. But to play there when it's full up and you're playing against Tony Adams, the thing is, but I went on loan when George went to Arsenal or before he went to Arsenal. Arsenal asked if I could they could borrow me. Um, they, the youth team was going. Um, away and uh, you know I went on loan to Arsenal and, and with Tony Adams and Rocky Rarcastle, Mickey Thomas so we went away to France and um, I, I was there just just um, for, for a few games over there with him and then come back and then George went to Arsenal but like that was a great experience so a lot of the Arsenal players that had got in the team then you know, as I say Rocky Rarcastle, uh, Paul Merson I played with with England anyway through the youth teams. I knew I knew a few of them. So, you know, it was it was you know, well they're not going to beat me tonight. You try your hardest that the players that you knew and weren't going to weren't going to score. But you know, to go away and get a nil nil, and we should have put one one nil as well. Leslie's goal, you know, it was, um, that was unbelievable. That was allowed. Yeah, but you know, it was. No, they're great results for the club, you know. And again, it, it just showed that we were good enough. Man United, we got stuffed. Mark Hughes is probably one of the best centre forwards I've ever seen. His strength and, and determination and tenacity in that. Um, he was he was a force to be reckoned with and he sort of realised that he was a top, top professional. Was there ever a time when you there might have been interest for you for, for other clubs wanting to buy you? You must have, you must have been catching the eye. A middle first team goalkeeper, 21 years old, England under 21 international. It must I, know, have been I, know, I know there was a bid put in for me for 400 grand, but Doc will never tell me who it was. Um, and I wouldn't have gone anyway. Uh, there's, listen, when I, I would have stayed at Millwall all my career. I uh, no, make no bones about it. Whether I would have played in the reserves or been a third choice goalkeeper, if it was my way, and I, I'll come on to that later in the in, interview, but if it was my way, I would have stayed at the club forever. I wouldn't, yeah. have, if I would have, I wouldn't have cared if I'd have brushed the dressing rooms. I would have stayed there forever. Really? Okay, now. Right, so. First season, say so we're top at one point. We finished tenth, which is a yeah. very good season. But yeah. we, um, after March, we didn't win a game. We didn't win a game, and then we had some big defeats away at Forest, uh, away at West Ham, at home to Spurs, and, and we sort of, um, yeah, last two months of the season didn't win a single game. Did you? Think, is that when the wheels you thought maybe started to come off? Yeah, I think I think um, that maybe we were knackered. I think we had given everything for the two years, um, maybe three years. You know, getting promoted first year and then 
you know, towards the end of that year, it was it was as you say, we didn't win. And and yeah, I think things start, whoever, whoever whether it was me, whether it was Macca or or whatever it may be, just just holes started to appear, you know. And uh, once you get beat once, it's like winning. You get into a habit of winning, but then all of a sudden, when you start losing, everything's a problem. You know, should I take a touch here? Should I take a touch there? I should have should have cleared it the first time, you know. So it was um, it was just one of them. We we lost our way. Uh, we lost our way, and uh, and uh, you know the second season told you that. Yeah, I remember. I mean, I was obviously I was about ten years old at this this time, so I do remember it. But one one result I remember very well. I suppose it's, sometimes I say bad memories stick out worse. Was the Spurs home defeat? Sort of yeah. Paul Shuatrick. Yeah, Paul Shuatrick. Yeah, and then Vinny Samways and maybe David Owls. There you go. I think they. I think they would have. I think they would have scored us, but. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it, we were done. You know, we were, we were not as a group of people, not as a group of players, we, we still felt, but I think looking back on it in hindsight, it was time to make big changes. Yes. Um, and Doc was too loyal to us. Simple, simple and straightforward as that. He, he lost his job from being too loyal. Um, yeah. and, uh, yeah, I think so. I think but, even, even in modern day football, a team will come up, unexpectedly do well in their first season, but then the big guns just sort of work, suss you out, don't they, in the second season? Of course they do. We, we had a style of play that, that you know, see, I, I, I sort of, you look at the players that we had and the style of play we played suited us. Yeah, two big people up front, what are you going to do, play at their feet? Get them running in behind us, it's not going to work. You're going to put, you know, Doc said, Doc, one thing I'll never forget they cannot score if the ball's in their half. True. You know, true. you understand what I mean? You've got a big, heavy ball then, don't forget. You ain't got like one where Beckham's going to lob you from the halfway line at Wimbledon. You know, the balls are ever. You've got time to get back and sort your feet out. But, you know, Doc used to say to us, they cannot score if the ball's in their half. But, he, he, you know, we did play some football. You have a look at Norwich at home when Jimmy oh, scored the well. second goal. We played some decent stuff. So, you know, it was all neat. Smash it up to Ted and Cass get hold of the ball and then play your football in their half. And that's what we did. But as you say, teams become um, aware of what we were doing. Um, and obviously, they sort of used to put an extra player in front of Ted or, you know, they'd pick the second balls up. And and then it was it was, um, it was was a struggle. It was a struggle then. So. 1989-90 season, yeah. relegation did, did, um, did come eventually. John Docker, he lost his job. Um, yeah, talk us through that. What you remember about that? Well, this is this is where I said I was going to come in the story. What people don't know, I broke my pelvis, um, and I played on it for six months. So, um, how'd you break it? Training? Or? Don't know. In training, it was a stress fracture of the sensitive pubis. So, you've got like a tendon that attaches to your to your um, muscle, and that had ripped away. So, although I could walk, I couldn't change pace. I couldn't. I couldn't do anything, and. You know, I didn't want to lose. I didn't want to not play for Millwall, not, not not lose my place because I think I was still I was still playing well, well enough. But it came to a stage that I only played twenty five games. I think twenty five or thirty games in that season. Mm. It came to a stage where I couldn't walk. I couldn't get out of bed in the morning, and all they were doing was giving me cortisone injections so I could play the game. And you know, people don't know that. People don't know. Um, you know that that ended my career. That, that it was as, as, as simple as that, that I was never, ever going to get my form back, ever. Because they wanted a, they wanted a um, what's the word they do, fuse, fuse it back to my hip, which meant I wouldn't have as much. I didn't have it done, but I laid in um, Blackheath Hospital for three or four weeks, watching the boys, you know, I think we played Man City in the cup, had about tw- two replays or something like that. And, you know, I said, stop, any chance I can come and watch a game? He went, no. Got to stay in bed. You know, he wanted me better. He wanted me back in the back in the team. Mm. And I remember I was out for four months, five months, and then come in for the last game in that season against Chelsea, and um, and uh, and we got beat three one. Kerry Dixon scored, I think, and then mm. then we were relegated. But it, it was it was um, it was really tough for me. Really, really tough. Well, Doc, say, Doc, Doc gets sacked. 
did that, how did that go? Did he come in and have a chat with you all and say his goodbyes? Or yeah, he just yeah, he just said he just says his goodbyes and uh, thanks for what he had done. And he, he he said to me personally, if I ever need a goalkeeper, I'll come and get you. So, you know, it was it was um, it was it was a top man. I've got so much respect for him. I mean, I still speak to him today, um, and you know, and and, and obviously. Um, all the lads as well, I don't know if you know, we always meet up once a year, that team, from, you know, Rhino flew over from Australia last year. Mm. And uh, we all go out and have a beer and, and, and uh, you know, just reminisce a little bit and, and have a chat, see how everybody is. But that's how close the group was. It, you know, we still go out today. Ted still comes. He has a beer. Darren owns a pub now down in Gravesend. So, you know, we're all, we're all, we're all still really good buddies and speak to each other. And we've got our WhatsApp group, which is funny and, you know, so it's all good. That's that's how good the camaraderie was. Thirty five years down the line, we're still yeah. talking, still that's going out, and good friends. That's brilliant, mate. So it was it was an achievement that I don't think any other Mill team will ever, will ever match. And, and well, I uh, hope they do. You say want. that. I, I hope they do. I think when you look at the Bournemouth and the Norwich, I think it gives you hope that there's still a little chance to get in the back door. But you know, I think I think our chairman, our chairman now, I think has done wonders for the club. I think Theo Pafitas, although they got to the FA Cup final and we got to the FA Cup final, which was, again, a great achievement, I think he left the club when he left in, in a real bad place. I think he sold all the top players, got some money back, and then he left the club. That's my opinion. Whether it's right or not, that's how I saw it. Mm. Um, and then, obviously, um, Berylson's come in and he's stabilised the club. Even during this COVID-19, you know, everything's... You know, you feel that he's he's good for the club, and I I just hope um, that you know that firstly Gary Rowett can do it, that he gets a chance and and, and gets a few quid to, to do the players. But yeah, I'm hopeful. You know, after this season, you know there there are glimmers of hope that we can make the playoffs and and do and did what we did win the last 13 games. It's, it's still maybe there, and I really really hope that one day we can. For the fans as well, more than anything else, uh, there's nothing more that Millwall fans wouldn't like than to travel and all them grounds again and have a fantastic couple of years. And because it was special, that's the thing. People say, oh, I wouldn't want to go up, but to look back at the games that you lot played in, the pictures, the videos, the kits, the Lewisham kit, it's just fucking iconic, mate. It calls you, calls yeah, you. Yeah, but want to... mate, the club would get about 146 million quid. We yeah. don't have to spend it all, but what it does is put the club in a good position. For, for the next maybe four or five, six, seven years, yeah. wh- whatever it may be. So if you win up, as long as the fans ain't got too, ex- too high expectations that we're going to go and beat Man City and Liverpool every week up at their places, that ain't going to happen. I think but just a season. Of we... Yeah, just a season. And that's that's what I think we've got to strive for. That, you know, it's still it's still there. It's still there, you know. And, uh, you know, I thought, I don't know, I thought Neil Harris has done a, a magnificent job at the club. I think when the clown left, Ian Holloway, I think that um, that Neil come in, stable to ship. I mean, if you have a look at the team we've got there now, all the players are Neils, apart from Woody. You know, all the players that are coming, yeah, he's changed his style of play and he give, he's given the players, Gary, um, a lot more belief in, in that they can play a different style of play, which you've got to applaud him for. And, and we're playing a, a little bit uh, of a different style, but it's working for us. The, the players have bought into it. But, um, you know, I just hope that, you know, next year he can, you know, he, he can push on a little bit more and we can become a stable, real stable championship club. And then every now and then we have a push for, for promotion. But, yeah, I think we can do it, mate. Um, you know, I've seen it done. So I know it can be done again. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So the doc loses his job. Bob Pearson takes over. Um, yeah. For Tink. What's your... What was your dealings with Bob Pearson? Because I mean, I've heard mixed a mixed bag, but he's definitely yeah, Bob, done, Uncle Bob, but it's Uncle Bob. Uncle Bob, he used to go in and see Uncle Bob. He was chief scout, so you know he, he had his little office. And when he was he was out working, he was out travelling the country, finding players. So it wasn't very often that he was in the club. But again, if you look at the players that that man brought into the club, mm. mate, unbelievable, unbelievable the players he brought in and the money he's earned the club. Um, and that was through the youth system. And I know, again, the chairman had to make a decision when he came in because I think the youth setup was costing us or were going to cost us five million a year to compete at the top level. So he had to pull us. But by doing that, it meant that we weren't going to attract the best youngsters um, in around South London because there's many. 
and there's many angry. So, you know, but, but Uncle Bob, Uncle Bob, what can we say about Uncle Bob? He was, he was, you know, he told you straight how it was. You know, you were shit today. Fucking liven up. That's, that's what it would be. Or you, you know, come in your flavour of the month. Come in, son. Come and have a cup of tea with Uncle Bob. Let's have a chat. You know, that's, that's what it was like. And then you had Lil. You, you, have you ever been told about Lil, the tea lady? Oh, my God. Lil, she, she must have been, she must have been in her 60s. And like, if we was training at the ground or whatever, she used to do us rolls and cup of tea and all that. But she was the most umpiest bastard you've ever met in your life. So you walk in, you're like, can I have two rolls, please, Lil, uh, tuna rolls? Fucking sit down and wait until I'm ready. That, that'll be it. You know, and the next one will go, sit down. Actually, I, I'm like, like, Teddy didn't have butter. How I remember this, I don't know. Teddy didn't have butter on his rolls. So he used to get his first because it was easy for Lil just to put the tuna in. I've been waiting there 20 minutes, right? And she's, Lil, I'm sitting here, mate. You served him first. He don't have butter. Wait your turn. So like, <laughs> from all the club, mate, it was, as I say to you, from, and that's how it was. It was, you know, Uncle Bob and Lil the tea lady. And, you know, have you heard about the picture in Doc's room as well, in the manager's room? It's a picture on the wall. So Doc, right, used to have a big table, his desk, and he used to have his hamlet, and he used to sit on the desk with his feet on the desk. And there'd be this picture in the background for him playing with Sheffield United, little midget out jumping someone six foot tall. And he used to talk to you, but if you got in that office with him on his own, you're in trouble. You ain't getting out there for two hours talking about this picture on the wall. So... <laughs> You know, you know, that was his pride and joy that he had out jumped someone. But mate, even in the even to the secretaries that were there at the time and, and everybody else, mate, everybody was brilliant. And and you know, that's yeah, I know you said about brilliant. Uncle Bob getting the job, and it was I think it was a real surprise to everybody. Yeah, because he, he was he was chief scout and uh and, and like he weren't a manager. But I suppose there was only a few games to the end of the season. We had a panic by, didn't we? And Paul, Paul, Paul um, Goddard, um, which, you know, the biggest, well, up until a few years ago, the biggest signing in the club's history. And, you know, it just it just wasn't there, was it? The spark had gone and, and there was only one way we were going. We were going down, unfortunately. One one thing I will say when you're saying, did I hear about certain things? A, a theme that's popped up a couple of times is the players' bar. If you weren't playing... Yeah, then you had to, then Rhino would go to macro, get all the booze, and then you'd have to, as a non-playing player, would have to serve people from behind the bar in the, in the, with the cans. Is it right? Well, I, I, t- I tell you a story. Well, obviously, it was I, I used to do it. So Rhino started it, and then I used to do it. So I used to go to a supermarket Saturday morning, buy five or six cases, stock it up. So like, take the money behind the bar, wherever it was, pound the can, or wherever it was back in them days. So you used to make about 200 quid, two or 300 quid a game. So um, so anyway, that night, Rhino would say, only I need 100 quid going out. So Rhino would take 100 quid out of it. And then and then some of the other lads would come and they had a nick a score out of it. And like, by the end, of the end of the year, we had about a grand in there. We'd taken about, about 10, 15 grand out. So when, when it when it comes to saying, right, oh, there's how much left in there? I said, look, there's a thousand pound in the kitty. They're all having a go at me saying, oh, I've nicked all the dough. Right, and then they're coming at me, and Rhino's had this, and he's had that. You know, it was it was carnage, but it, it was it was it was just another part of it. And that was our players' land, you know, a way to earn money to take us away at the end of the year. It's just like these stories are gold, and they won't you won't get these from current Premier League players when they retire. It's just it was just a different world then, wasn't it? You could get and away it's with shame, so isn't it? More. And it's a shame. Yeah, it and it's a shame, shame that footballers are right robots now, isn't it? <laughs> not, our, not our boys, but you look at the Premier League, every team tries to play the same way, tries to play the same football, and they go and get beat 6-0 by Man City, and they think they've done all right. You know what I mean? How about making a tackle and hurting one of them? You know, I know you might get sent off, but do you know what I mean? It's like robotic. Robotic. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Well, so, Bob Pearson... I won't, get any, I won't get any work after this interview, will I? My, my career will be dead. <laughs> Only joking, um, Gary. I'm just making a joke there, mate, if Gary Rout's watching. <laughs> well, I've seen you a couple of times at the den and I've said hello, but I thought I thought he's working for the clubs. So I thought he might be a bit reserved, but um no, no. chance. It's fucking brilliant. <laughs> no, I mean I'm back to do the Billy Neal Lounge on a Saturday. Um, you know, I'm I'm privileged to do that. They've asked me to go back. I have a bit of a giggle in there with all the fans. Um so yeah, I, I you know, as I said, I, I would have cleaned the dressing rooms to stay at the club. I love the club, I've been brought up with the club. 
you know they're they're in me in my bones so you know it's um I, I'll always be there as long as they want me there I'll, I'll always be there and, and doing same for them brilliant so son but you know you you wanted to stay at Mill your whole career funny enough the subject we're going to get on to now is sort of the beginning of the end although it was a quite a delayed one Bruce Rioff yeah. comes in gets the job uh, brought some good players with him. Um, we've, heard, we've heard a few things. Obviously, he brings with him uh, Keith Brannigan. I could yeah. never tell you two a parting goal. No, no, no. Like, Keith, <laughs> Keith Brannigan, Doc signed from Cambridge in the Christmas of the second season. Oh, sorry. The it might be in the first season. John Docherty signed Branny, yeah. Oh, he mistake. pulled me in the lift. He said, I'm signing the goalkeeper, but it's all right. He's no threat here. So, oh. it wasn't... It wasn't. A, he bought a piece of keeper into to make me work harder and, and basically oh. I had it all my own way. There was no one no one there really to challenge me. What about so, Aidan Davison? I remember Aidan Davison. Aidan, Aidan well. coming with, with Bruce Rioch. I mean, I'll go on to the story. So yeah. Bruce Rioch coming, right? So you got to imagine, right, that, and, and this is a story. When we got promoted, right, Bruce wrote a letter, right, to the chairman, Reg Burr, congratulations on your achievement, you know, all the best. And then he brought it down to us and he put it in the dressing room. He was at Middlesbrough. That got him the job. Let me tell you now, that got him the job. So Bruce Riox wrote a letter. From Middlesbrough. From Middlesbrough. Yeah, congratulating us. Congratulating us. He's in the job, right? So, so, right, so, anyway, you can imagine, as I was saying, your doc has treated us like men all the way through. Mm. The first day, first day we've come in, he's got us sat down, unshaven, 10% of your wages. You're late for training, 20% of your wages. If you come in in jeans, 10% of your wages. After the third time, Terry Earl looks up and went, put me on the list. I promise you. And, and then he didn't know, he, he, whoa, he, he didn't know. But that's what he was like. He'd come in really heavy with the boys straight away, really heavy. Now, me and Bruce didn't get on. Me and Bruce never got on. i um, the first one to say that. Um not about you that they didn't get over it. No, he, he, he sort of proper put a knife into me. You know, I was I was putting on a bit of weight for the simple fact is I couldn't move. My my pelvis and, uh, you know, I, I watched one of the interviews with Kenny Cunningham and he was telling you quite a funny story about Steve Harrison running around the park with us. But it wasn't for the fact that he said I weren't buying into it. I couldn't move. My left leg and my groin... Was, was and then my calves were pulling and everything else. I couldn't get my fitness. You know, I couldn't get my fitness. I couldn't train every day like everybody was doing. So naturally, when you, when you don't train as much and train as hard, you're going to put on weight because as a footballer, you need to, to not eat McDonald's like you're going to come on to, but you need to eat food to keep your strength up. So when you're not training as hard, you put on a bit of weight. You're, so you're that's what... the goalkeepers either, was you? No, six eight. Um, no, five eleven. <laughs> five eleven. I was yeah. five eleven. But listen, he was always like that. He was always like that. Like he's always lean. Yeah, I mean, if you have a look, if you have a look, I mean, I've got I've got some rocks and boulders, but it, it, it was it was you know I was I was always fit and, and played well. But when that pelvis when that pelvis injury got, I knew as soon as I I knew they the club threw me to Sweden. And I saw a Professor Ericsson. He put a needle through my stomach that big, smashed it through, um, and he put dye in me to find injury. And, and like for Millwall to fly me to Sweden, obviously. So they come back, and that's when it was diagnosed. So from that point onwards, as I said, you, I got back and played the last game against Chelsea. It was a tough pre-season for me, um, out of season, because I was I was so worried about you know, doing it again. So, you know, and then and then Bruce come in and put all these new rules in and so on and so forth. And, and they took us, I mean, we were still mad. The group was still mad, you know. He took us away to Tenerife um, to get to know the lads, but he didn't take us to the south side of the island, take us to the north side of the island. So we, as soon as we got there, the boys went, fuck this, we're off. So we we left Keith Brannigan, Les Briley and the uh, physio, Peter Melville, they all stayed with Bruce. The rest of us fucked off for four days. Like, we just took our bags and fucking went. So, Terry Erlock was found on the beach covered in tar. You know, it's like, so he was bollocks. But he, like, then sort of, I was the youngest. Like, Les used to hold the whip. So, they said, I want to get in a cab. And it was two hours 
So I had to do two hours there and two hours back. So I had to go get in a cab for two hours. And they said, where are the boys? I was saying, I ain't got a clue, mate. I ain't got to you in Olney. I said, Les, I don't know where they are. So this is the story about McDonald's I'm leading up to, right? So so, any, so anyway, I had to go back because I'm the youngster, get the, to get the players whip so the boys can have a booze. Right? It was about two or three grand. So we've got, we've got, I've gone and got the money, come back. Terry's bought some new clothes because he's just covered in tar. And we're all having a good time. So anyway, Bruce has sent, Bruce has sent a message out, get the boys back. I want to take them out for dinner on Thursday before we go home on Friday. We ain't seen Bruce. He's come out to, he's come out to meet us and get to know us. We ain't giving him the time of day to get to. As soon as he's gone, you're getting fined and all that. He had lost us straight away. So so anyway, um, I think Alan Walker was there. So we're, we're in a hotel. We're plotted in an hotel around a round the pool and we, we was trying to nick a bird or one of the boys were trying to nick a bird during the night so we could go in their room and sleep so we didn't have to pay anything or anything like that. That's so, what I was going to say, uh, like, did you, so you must have had rooms and everything where Bruce... Well, oh, we might have booked one or two rooms but a couple of us were open we would pull a few birds or whatever which we did but like, so that's how it was and we just had to buy a pair of shorts here and there, new t-shirt and we was ready for the next day or what we had in our bag. So, anyway... Uh, it was it was unbelievable because the boys trying to meet all need. We're hungry. Go down to McDonald's, get like seven Big Macs and some what you call it. So Alan Walker, Peter Melville, and Les Briley have been sent over by Bruce to find us all to tell us to go back because we're going to have a meal on Thursday night. So Alan Walker's gone. Well, where are we? He said all need will be eating. He said so. We're going to McDonald's. So it's unbelievable, right? Unbelievable. That the lads have sent me to McDonald's, right? I've bought about seven or eight Big Macs, right, and some chips and everything else like that. And why I'm waiting for them, I'm eating my own because I've got to carry all the bags. So I've got a Big Mac, chips, and a Coke, right? And seven Big Macs by the side of me with chips and everything else. Well, that's where that's where all the jokes have come from. Because they've, they've gone on the way down that Orney's going to, we're going to find Orney and McDonald's. Unbelievably, they did. They found me at McDonald's in Tenerife. And then I had to take all this stuff back up back up there. But that was that. So, so that's where that's where the myths about me eating McDonald's and everything else and pulling into service station is a myth. Yeah, I did struggle with my weight, um, but that was after I broke my pelvis and, and I couldn't get my phone back. So it was... I remember Mick, you're you're going on to that season where the next season with Mick McCarthy. Oh no, with Bruce actually. I played, 30, I played 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 thirty eight games. Nineteen ninety ninety one. Yeah, you sort of battled it out with with Keith Brannigan. No, he, battled, no, no, he battled it out with me, not not the other way around. So, so I played. I played. 30, I, played 30, yeah, he, I played thirty eight games. He played twelve or something. Right. So let's get that right beforehand. It was but, sort of start of the season a bit of both, and then you you got that was it. You was yeah. in there. So Bruce didn't like me, but he realised I was a better keeper. Like, I mean, even with a bad injury and I couldn't train as much, I, I was still half decent, you know. I, was, I, I was, still not sorted? was the injury still, did you have an op or whatever? No, 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 it, it couldn't be sorted. It, it you know, it, had, we, it was trying to heal and trying to, the, the bone was trying to heal back to bone, if you know what I mean, and it could never happen. Mm. So... Um, so then obviously when you train and you're trying to get back fit because your body's compensating for that injury, then you start overloading other parts of your body mm. and then you start putting your calf and you might do an hamstring and you're forever fighting a battle. So, you know, 38 games the next year and yeah, probably still putting on a few pounds, but I couldn't do nothing about it. You know, people say he was, he was eating too much and didn't buy into it like Kenny said. But listen, uh, it was it wasn't the case. It was the fact that I was depressed, mate. I was I was proper depressed that I knew my career was over. I knew I knew that I could never get back to what I was. So, you know, it was it was um, it was just how it was. But I managed to nick another thirty eight games, and then and then um, I don't know what I did after that. That season was in the play. We got to the playoffs again. We nearly we got promoted again yeah. straight away. Other players coming to the club: John McGinley, Paul yeah. Kerr, Alex Ray. Johnny Good Boy, Kenny Cunningham. Johnny uh, Good Boy. Johnny Good Boy and Jamie <laughs> Maitland. Johnny Good Boy and Jamie. What was it, Jamie? Jamie Maitland, yeah. Uh, Malcolm <laughs> Allen. Malcolm Allen and... Pan yeah, Face. Like... Pan Face. His face looked like a frying pan, didn't it? It was that flat. Do you know what? He's another one. I don't know if you saw his interview. He said that he, he went out of you a couple of weekends and he saw you 
devour a few kebabs. Right. <laughs> you see what I mean? Do you see what I mean? Everything's about that. Let yeah, me tell you a story about Alex Ray. I can't... Alex Ray obviously has come through being an alcoholic, right? So he won't mind me telling the story. And I spoke to Alex the other day. We're still very good friends and see each other. So, he, by the way, he's one of the best midfield players of Millwall all time. Um, he was absolutely, abs- absolutely different class, right? So, him and Malcolm Allen used to live in Mepham, right? They were nuts. Both of them were absolutely crazy. So, they've rung me up out of the blue, right? Out of the blue, I'm at home, right? Indoors, watching the TV. Only, can you come and get us? What's the matter? Drunk driving, gone through the windscreen. Right? So, I've gone... Fucking hell, where are you? So they've told me they're on the M2 somewhere or A2. So I've got in my car, rushed through the Dartford Tunnel, picked them up, Clara all down their shirt. Malcolm Allen's got a great big cut in his head. Only we can't go to hospital, but we can still go out. So he said, go and get me a shirt. We're going Zens. So they both gone through the windscreen. Both gone through the windscreen. They've left the car there. I can't say too much more than that, right? So they've left the car there, and, and like obviously we've gone out. The next day he's come in, obviously got in early. You might have spoke to Peter Melville, and he's got the strips in his head. So no one knows. So no one knows he's gone through the windscreen. It's all been kept hush hush. But in training, he weren't heading the ball. So Bruce, why aren't you heading the ball? He said, no, it's a bit sore this morning, a little spot there. I said, I'll let it, don't worry. So if you notice, there's a period of maybe one or two games he weren't heading the ball. He had loads of stitches in his head where he'd gone through the windscreen with Alex Ray, right? And they were under a bridge somewhere on the M2 or A2. I had to pick them up, and I promise you, we went from there. He went and got a shirt, and we went to Zen's. <laughs> <laughs> we went to Zen's nightclub afterwards in Dartford. We didn't get in because it was still claret going down his shirt. But, um, you know, it was... That's, it was mad. So it hadn't changed from the new, the new crop coming in, as you like, the new players... But like they're even worse. They're nuts. Malcolm Allen and Alex Ray together, mate, was a powerful, powerful combination. They were absolute crackers. Crackers. Oh, dear. Um, other players, Paul Kerr. What can you tell us about Nookie. Paul Kerr? Nookie. Nookie. Nookie Bear. He was a great player. and He, he, he was our top scorer uh, one year, and then we sold him to Paul Vow. I can't work it out. Uh, again, it was Bruce Riach. I mean, I can remember coming in at half-time, Malcolm Allen, Paul Kerr, Bruce Riach fighting. That was a, that was half time. They're fighting in the dressing room, proper, proper fisty cloughs, fighting in the dressing room, and then the, the bell goes and we go out second half. I mean, it, it, it was some of it was crackers. Bruce was like off his head. It was you know, his man management was shit. He was at the right disciplinarian, wasn't he? No, but it weren't even that. I mean, his brother was in insurance, right? Like his brother was in insurance, and obviously we've got right <laughs> pardon. Could have got Alex Ray a new windscreen. <laughs> <laughs> That's not bad, actually. I didn't think of that. So his brother was in insurance, and he was trying to sell us. Bruce was trying to get us to buy insurance policies with his brother, but that would have mucked up our PFA pension. So it was like it was. It was just like he was just mad. He was proper wanting to find people, and you know he had like the, the, the story with Steve Harrison. He brought him in. Like he was there with Bruce, and you know the story, didn't you? You know, you know what happened in the in the in the hotel room. You yeah, know, Johnny, you know Johnny Steve Good, Strick. Johnny Goodboy told us about this. Yeah, right. Steve, so he, it's not a big log that goes in it. He cuts them off. So, like with his ass, he cut. He used to cut them off, right? But the only reason, the only reason why he'd done it because we was on his back because he'd done it for the England team, and he didn't do it for us. So you can imagine, big time, Charlie. You you can do your little trick for them, but you can't do it for us. We were in. We were in a room. No one else was in there. Ian McNeil had his ear to the door. Ian McNeil, his assistant manager, them two Scotch eggs, weren't they? Had their, had their ear to the door, right? So, obviously, he knows what's going on. We're all there laughing our heads off and everything else like that. He's on the top of the wardrobe, pint glass at the bottom, and like uh, he's cut, cutting off these nuggets, and they're sort of all going in the glass. So, anyway, he opened the door. Bruce called him. We was away to Ipswich. Right, Bruce Rick called him. He was sacked on the spot. Sacked on the spot. But but that was it. But Mick McCarthy was in the team by then. Uh, Mick, uh, but Mick had an agenda. Mick Mick. Although I really like Mick, Mick wanted to get rid of me straight away. Um, 
yeah, he wanted to get rid of me. Like, I think he might have been getting a few quid for the septic tanks that were coming in, you know what I mean? But um, I think I think that's a bit of fun, Mick, as well, if you're going to watch. But like, there were some Americans that come into the club. You know, it's like all of a sudden the Americans are flavour of the month. It might have been that the World Cup might have been in America a little bit before. They wanted to promote the football and in comes Casey Keller. So now at the club, now at the club, myself, Brannigan, Aidan Davison, Casey Keller, Bonnie Ginsberg, Peter Rucker, Cole Emerson. It's fucking seven goalkeepers. Jesus. Plus the youth team. So there's eight goalkeepers at Millwall. Fucking hell. Work that out. Hey. <laughs> well, was all, so you, because I looked, because obviously the 90, you played uh, most of the season. Let's say you, you um, Keith Brannigan was floating about, but you dislodged him and you played the, mo- the majority of the time, played the playoffs. We lost to Brighton. The following season, you were still at the club. But I checked the, 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 uh, the stats. You didn't, you didn't play one game. It was Casey Keller, Aidan Davidson and Keith Brannigan around it. Yeah, so so basically that's where Mick come in. I, cry, I tell you, I'm not, I'm not afraid to say anything. I went on loan to Middlesbrough in the Premier League. Right, so Mick said Middlesbrough come in for you. They want you know, go as backup because Steve Pez got the injured. Ian Ironside is going to play in goal. You're going to be back up in the Premier League. Yeah, no problem. We'll do it for a month. Let's get me back playing. So I went to Middlesbrough. The first game was against Ipswich, right? And Ian Einstein got injured, right? So I went in goal and we drew 1-1. The next game, Sheffield United at home uh, in Middlesbrough. We won 2-0, clean sheet. Then we went to Man City, 1-1-0, clean sheet. Then we drew 3-3 at QPR. So Lenny Lawrence is the manager. He said, only I'll sign you. So he phoned up Mick and Mick said, give me 50 grand for him. So then he said, no, no, no. He said, it's done. So we were playing Newcastle away in the cup the next game, right? Ian Ironside was back fit by now. So it was in the League Cup. So he, he went, look, only he said, you've done brilliant for me. He said, I would sign you, but, you know, it's just how it is at the moment. We're going to let you go back. So that was that, went back. And then the next week, I'm on loan at Stoke. I've gone to Stoke. Now, Stoke are playing Cambridge in the same... In the same uh, in the same competition. Mick's gone, yeah, you can play. Fucking hell, can you believe it? So he wouldn't let me play against Newcastle for Middlesbrough because they wanted to sign me. Now I'm playing against Cambridge for the Potters up the road, you know what I mean? Mick had an agenda. Mick, when he'd come in as a centre-half, Mick was always going to be the next manager. You don't. I didn't see it. I wasn't intelligent enough at the time to have a look. All I wanted to do was play football. You know, I was a young kid, a little bit uh, probably immature and, and probably... You know, you know, whatever had happened. But Mick's agenda was he was at his end of his career. He was looking for a manager's job. And obviously he'd seen the old brigade and he wanted rid of them. He wanted rid of it. Mate, Millwall still owe me a lot of money. I had a contract at Millwall um, when I signed, when Bruce came in. And it was the biggest contract of my life, right? Um, I was playing for England. The chairman and John Dock had, had promised me to the money so when Bruce come in the first thing he had to do was honour that contract and he didn't want to honour it he said I didn't even give Palace to that money at Middlesbrough so straight away that, that's where Bruce put his back up with me I was probably one of the biggest earners at the club during during um, when I wasn't wasn't going to play I was, when I was say I was in the Middlesbrough so he wanted to get rid of me I walked away from the club let me tell you them, them owing me a six figure fee really I've never claimed it Fucking no! How did, how did that feel for you? Obviously, you're you're you come Mill fan. You come through the youth team. You're in the first team. You're, you're you know you're yeah. the goalkeeper in the in the Premier League. In effect, what it was, and then from it to go to that to where it was, how it ended. How, yeah. how was that feel? Like, sad, you know, oh, mate. Sad. I remember going in Mick's office. I've been. You got to remember Watford on loan, Middlesbrough on loan, Stoke on loan. Um, and then I signed for Portsmouth in '92. Well, before that, I walked into Mick's office. Now, this is very quick. This is under a year from being playing in the top flight for now not being wanted at the club. Oh, Mick not wanting me, not being wanted at the club because Reg Bird did. But for me, not being wanted at the club. He went, come over to me and said, you're going on loan to Woking. And I just walked out of there crying my eyes out. Walked across, I'll never forget, walking across the, the, the lounge where we trained at Elton. Just crying my eyes out, just sat in the dressing room and cried. You know, it was, I've gone from playing for England to, to um, you know, playing 38 games last year, playing in the Premier League, and now I'm fucking playing at Woking. So I've played one game. 
I should have gone. I played one game, we got beat fucking 4-1 at Yeovil. But, you know, that's, 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 that's just how it was. But, you know, what, that was it. Why was there so many keepers in? Aidan Davison, Casey Keller, lucky Keith Brannigan. Yeah, yeah, but but that, that was, you know, what's the point? Peter Rucker, about 48 when he came. Bonnie Ginsberg, fucking hell, what has he done? I mean, I at remember, least... I remember those two. Right, Bonnie Ginsburg. Cole Emerson went on to have a great career and he's a lovely lad and he come through the youth system. So Cole Emerson, no problem. Um, then you had Branny, you had me, Aidan Davison. You know, you know, it was it's madness. So you can imagine not only me, forget about me, you've got Keith, Aidan, and everybody else feeling the same way. Do you know what I mean? Who's gonna play? How are you gonna prepare? You know what I mean? It was just a crazy, a crazy period. And then obviously um, sorry, Casey weren't there at the time, but then obviously Mick brought in Casey. Um, and that was it. He was going to always stick by Casey. Mm. Well, I mean, you spoke about him then, um, quickly. Have you any good stories on him, Steve Harrison? Because we've heard some Steve, fucking yeah, I think, I think you've heard the ones where Bruce took us away to Plymouth, haven't you? And, and um, it, it was a golf course. Unbelievably, right? Paul Stevenson on a golf course got an hole in one, right? Two weeks later, got another hole in one, right? Listen, probably this is probably true. For, I played with him both times. Steve Harrison walked out the hotel now. There was a massive hill like that. And at the bottom of it was a great big lake like that. He'd done a fucking head over hills all the way down this hill. Must have been 150 to 200 yards. Round and round and round and round and then plopped straight in the water. Now, you can imagine Bruce Reel's face. He's a, <laughs> he's a disciplinarian. So he's got out of the water and just started training in, in wet gear. So he's training us at this Plymouth Hotel in his wet gear. He's done a rolling poly. The boys are crazy. You, you can imagine, can't you? The boys are absolutely, absolutely, just absolute crying. He was brilliant. And and let me tell you, he was he was a shining light for me. He he, he did care about me. And, um, you know, he, he tried to get me fit. And, uh, you know, it didn't work out. He got himself very fit, but as, as Kenny said. But, um, you know, I just, I just... I just at that time, you know, as Kenny said, as Kenny said as well in, in your interview, that football has changed now. There's nutritionists, there's dietitians. They went off the hock. They think if you don't eat, you lose weight. It don't work like that. I promise you, I've been on every diet you can imagine. I promise you, if you don't eat food, you do not lose weight. You've got to eat the right food and to lose weight. You know, you were talking to me earlier about seven and a half, doing seven and a half mile, and then, you know, you, unless you do it properly. So, you know, I wasn't doing it properly. It was obvious that I couldn't work. I was probably overloading myself too much with food, and I wasn't burning it off. That's the simple, simple way of me putting on weight, not going down McDonald's and the drive throughs and everything else. Yeah, we did have a beer in them days. I'm not going to lie to that. Um, but it was at the right times. It was Saturday night after a game. We might have a Tuesday club. Yeah. So no, it was um, it, it was just mad times, you know. And uh, yeah, then I left the club and played for played for Woking, and then I made a wrong move. I went to Portsmouth. I was my, I was knackered. I couldn't walk by then. My first training session at Portsmouth, I done my calf. I had to have an operation. Oh. So I'd signed two years. I played seven games now in two and a half years. I played seven games with Portsmouth. I had me thing got back, and then it was right. I'm finished. I'm, you know, ninety. You know, I think it was uh, signed from Christmas '92, and then by '94, when my contract was finished, you know, I was trying my hardest to get back, and he didn't want to know Jim Smith. He, you know, he, he he had Knightsy there, and Knightsy was a good keeper, to be fair. Um, and I, I couldn't get in, so I made a decision. What do you want to do? Do you want to play football? Um, at the highest level or do you want to play football at a low level and make sure you play every week so it was an easy answer I went to Hartlepool um, and uh, I stayed there for two years had a great last two years of my career had an had a absolutely blinding time I signed first thing I did was walk in the police station I said I'd like a drink on a Saturday evening I'm going to come in get breath tested if I'm under then I'm driving home if I'm over you're taking me home and, and that's how it started. And it was it was an it was an absolute real breeze of a two years. Um, I'm going to tell you something you don't know in a minute as well. Uh, it was and and it sort of it just sort of got me a little bit. I played I played I think about seventy odd games 
um, 78 odd games in the in the last two years. I didn't train a hell of a lot, maybe three times a week, but um, I, I got through it and uh, I've done all right. So the end of the contract come, I made the decision and I want to come back down south. I've had enough of the monkey hangers and, and like, you know, wanted to come home. So I come back and signed for Dover in the conference um, and had an unbelievable season now. And where did I go back to? Someone come in for me. Who was that? Someone come in for you? Yeah. Me Wolf? That's it. John Doherty. 1997, he went back to the club. Oh, of course he did. Yeah, he came back. We were, we were in administration and I walked in his office and Brentford were wanting to sign me as well. Webby was at Brentford. So I walked in and we was in administration. Alan McCleary's contract went through. Mine didn't because we was in administration. So Doc said, what do you want to do? He said, do you want to, do you want to stay here? Um, or you can go to Brentford a few years a few years there. So I went, Doc, if you're here, I'm with you. I said, you know what I'm like. You're going to give me time. I'll get myself as fit as I can. And because I think Timmy Carter was there at the time, his goalkeeper, I think Casey's gone and, and everything else. A few years has gone past. So I come back in and within three weeks, four <laughs> weeks, he had gone and Billy Bonds had come in. Mm. So now I'm, I'm in a position where I'm never going to get fit to sort of challenge and, and that was my end of career. I played a few reserve games. I played at the new stadium, which not in a first team game, but in a reserve team game. So I can say I've played at both grounds now, which okay, which is great, nice. which is great for me. But yeah, so um, I ended up in '97 and then went went on from there. Played for Canvey Island and got, to, which was my local club. Jeff King had a few kids, quid, and um, you know he wanted me there. He had an unbelievable side. Went all the way up the leagues. Won every league every year. Uh, and then Farnborough come in for me in the conference. Went back to Farnborough. Didn't like it there, so come back to Canvey. Finished my career there at Dully Jamlet, funny enough. I played at Dully Jamlet and uh, I'd done something to my leg in the last five minutes. And I just went, that's it. No more. And, and then he said, right, you're our goalkeeping coach. So I'd done that, then went into a bit of management, non-league for a couple of seasons. Found out that I was, I didn't like it. I didn't like the management side of it and, and it wasn't for me. Um and then obviously went back to Millwall, done a bit of goalkeeping coaching, and, and but obviously weren't getting paid. So, you know, I didn't earn enough money to retire as the boys had done there. If, if I was playing for football now for as long as I did at the top flight, I'd be made for life. But um, so eventually um, got myself, I, I, was, I was, as I say, I was really depressed. Once I finished Millwall, I sat in a pub for eight months, just drinking, just weren't an alcoholic. But it was, you know, when you know that your first love football and, you you know, Millwall have been taken away from you and uh, you can't play for them anymore and you're not going to play football anymore, you know, it's it's hard. It's hard. And um, so that was that. And um, that's how it's been. But sort of pulled myself around. Didn't have a lot of money left in the bank. Sort of had to sort of say, right, OK, all neat. It's time to pull yourself together. And I started a company 20 years ago and... Thank God it's uh, it's worked out all right. Well, before we started filming, I said, it's a bit echoey in there. And you said, yeah, that'll be the size of my house, mate. <laughs> <laughs> That's the left wing. We're in, we're in the left wing of the house, not the right. <laughs> um, <laughs> listen, some some you're a Millwall fan, so some great times as a fan, as a player, and some and some not so good times as well. If you could pick, if you could pick out, I'll, I'll give you two here. I'll give you one as a player and one as a fan. Two standout memories. One when you was playing and then one as a supporter. I think making my debut um, for Millwall um, was probably the proudest moment of my football career. Um, I think it, it meant a lot, not only to me, but to my family. So I think doing that and obviously the penalty save at Bournemouth, everybody remembers that. It was unbelievable. But uh, I suppose as a fan, Barry Kitchener, um, trying an overhead kick. Well, I think we were 3-1, 3 nil down at home uh, against Exit Home. We ended up winning 5-4. And Barry Kitchener doing an overhead kick in the cold blow lane and missing it and getting carried off with a bad back was, was a funny moment for me. I can remember Paul Roberts going to Brentford. And, uh, oh, sweet, I can remember Paul Roberts going, for, going to Brentford. Um, and he come back with blonde air. And he was giving the Millwall fans a bit of stick. I can remember a Millwall fan running on the pitch and giving him a right hook and he got stretched off. Like, like just 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 things that, that that 
you can't buy, you know, just that, that mill wall, you know, the mill, you know, we go through you when you're playing and you're doing well. And it's, it's just, you know, I don't care what anybody says, mill or a real special club. Um, the supporters get real bad, real bad press and they've done for as long as I can remember, but they're the most passionate supporters in the country for me. You know, you get all these people from all over the world going to watch Liverpool's and Man City and the moody Chelsea supporters. They ain't got any English supporters. They're all foreign, you know. Yeah. But Mill supporters are, are from the area. You know, their, their kids have been brought up to support them. And everybody that's in that ground understands the club. And that's that is a football club. It's a very special thing to have. Yeah, we get, we get out of line a little bit sometimes. But, you know, on the whole, we're very well behaved. And... Uh, we deserve a lot more credit than what we get for the way our club is run um, and how good it is. Spot on, mate. If you could pick three-year-old Millwall teammates to go out uh, Tuesday club tomorrow, three year ex club oh, teammates. Only oh, three. mate. Oh. It's got to be Terry Erlock for one because he's one funny man when he's drunk. Um, Terry Erlock, Alex Ray, definitely. Um, and then would be the other one. I suppose it would be Casey Keller because then he wouldn't take me place, would he? So I could get him pissed. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I think I think Alex Ray and, and uh, Alex Ray and, and Terry Erlock is an unbelievable man. You know what he's what he's gone through in his career and what he's ach- achieved as well. And if if you go out drinking with him, mate, you'll understand. I don't know if you've ever had the pleasure of having a night with him, oh, but he's he's he's, he's one funny man when he's had a drink and he's uh, he's he was a pleasure to be all the squad was. I mean, it's unfair ask me the top three. I mean, I, we, we all still go out drinking, as I said, getting together. So, you know, let's say the top top 15 fellas, you know, we all meet up, but, you know, it's a good crack. Yeah. We take the piss out of each other. But no, them three or four years at the Den, mate, were, were, were absolutely brilliant. And I, and I really... And Gary Rao and... And the players as well can can achieve something at the club and, and, and do the impossible these days with the money and, and get us up there again because it'll be it'll be something the Premier League has never seen. Brilliant. Mate, honestly, thanks for your time. It's been absolutely brilliant. Loved it. Loved every minute. No worries. So I thought I see you down no a few times, had a quick chat and I thought, will he come on? Won't he come on? Because he's a you know, work for the club, it might be a bit difficult, but you don't actually work directly for the club and uh, no old barred. No, no it's, it, what's the point? You know what I mean? It's uh, it's um, it's what Millwall fans want to hear. They want to hear the truth. They don't want to, they want me to tell them porky pies or anything like that. Um, so not that I could eat one there as it happens, but uh, but <laughs> but, but no, um, no, it's, it's they they deserve that when you're playing. So I'm not going to tell them any lies while I'm you know while I'm being interviewed by you. But it's refreshing as well. Let me say. That, uh, what you're doing, Lions TV, mate. It's uh, it's good. You want to keep it going. It, it gives uh, it gives the, the, the club a, a, an identity as well, which which they're not doing unbelievably. So you know, keep keep doing it and get yourself uh, get yourself more viewers and uh, get yourself up there, get yourself worldwide. Cheers, mate. Really appreciate the comments. Good to speak to you, top man, Ollie. All right, mate. Legend. Cheers, mate. Take care.